All right, we're about five seconds in and recording. We're going to hit the uh, intro. A Wicked Sobriety Production. Welcome to the Dirtback Adventures podcast, an in-depth interview-style podcast about outdoor recreation by Wicked Sobriety Productions, hosted by me, Derek Kern. Listen now for free wherever you get your podcasts. Links in the show notes. Jesus. <laughs> that ain't going to work. Is she outside? Huh? Why are the boys out there? Are they coming back here? This is why I need a, a studio. <laughs> <laughs> this exact same thing happened when Connor came, literally exact same time and starting the podcast, and we had just started, and I was talking to him. But I even said it was going to happen. And I looked over, and I seen like 17 kids' heads run across the yard and start beating on the door. I was like, oh, <laughs> fucking great. <laughs> All right, let's try this again. I'll uh, hit record again. We'll wait for the intro to go through, and then we'll start. All right. All right, intro. Maybe. A Wicked Sobriety Production. Welcome to the Dirtback Adventures podcast, an in-depth interview-style podcast about outdoor recreation by Wicked Sobriety Productions, hosted by me, Derek Kern. Listen now for free wherever you get your podcasts. Links in the show notes. Dirtbag Adventures, episode 003, Nathan Kern. What's up, man? Welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, man. I appreciate you uh, coming up this morning. How was the ride? Uh, frigid. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you said it started getting pretty cold when you came up through Big Canoe. Would you come up 53? Yeah, 53. Yeah. It's the fastest route. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so in the first podcast, I kind of introduce the person or the guest that I was interviewing, but I'm going to change it up a little bit and I'm going to let you introduce yourself. So tell everybody how old you are, what your name is, where you're born and raised, and uh, maybe if you've got a favorite hobby or uh, whatever it is, uh, if you want to tell us, you can go ahead and tell us that. All right. Uh, my name's Nathan Kern, uh, youngest brother or second, second. old second yeah. to Derek. Uh, born and raised for South County, coming, however you want to see it. Um, I do all the hunting, fishing, motorcycle riding, dirt bikes, full wheelers, gun shooting, all of it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what do you do for work? I'm a body technician in a body shop. Okay. And just for everybody out there, he's, I'm not going to name the company, but it's one of the biggest uh, dealerships probably in the southeast um, that he's there so he stays pretty busy with that on Christmas Eve I was talking to mom and dad about some stuff um, and I don't remember this myself so I wanted to ask you when I was a boy I was introduced to hunting and I guess fishing technically maybe even camping from Papa yeah. And for everybody out there, Papa is Nathan and I's grandfather on mom's side. Um, I'm five years older than Nathan, so by the time I was six or seven years old, Papa was already ill, couldn't really take me hunting or fishing anymore. So I don't, I didn't think that you had ever gotten a chance to go with Papa. I had been to the club that I can remember like at least twice. Okay, so that's what I was going to ask you about. Mom said that there was a time when I think it might've even been the very last time Papa ever went down there. He wasn't even the president of the club anymore. He was just a member and he wanted to take me and you down there. But he, since he was not feeling well, he didn't think that he could take care of both of us at the same time. So he actually talked dad into going. 
I think I do remember that. And dad went, and see, I don't remember it. I didn't, when mom was telling me this, and I was like, really? I feel like I remember one of the times I was ever down there. I think dad had been with us. Yeah, so apparently <clears throat> mom was saying that dad went with us, and we went down there, and I don't, I'm don't. i assuming we stayed over the weekend. but Yeah. So that kind of brings me around to my next question. Um, as a kid, you were probably like me. You are introduced to the outdoors pretty early. Do you hold Papa in regards to being the one that introduced you since you did go with Papa a few times hunting or fishing? And you said you do remember going down there a few times, but I'm interested to know, like, what is the first significant, uh, first significant event or outdoor activity that you did that you can remember really well? So I know... In the early days, starting off, it was two or three times with Papa, which kind of opened, I wouldn't really say open the door to hunting, but that's kind of where it starts, I guess. But the biggest thing I can remember just growing up, we didn't have TVs and game systems, and we had four-wheelers and stuff. And that's, I would just remember always being in the woods, cutting trails for the four-wheelers. Um, even there was even a couple times we went down to the neighbor's pond and did some fishing. So I wouldn't necessarily pay pa- say Papa was there to do that, but it was more of just the way we grew up. Yeah, um, we did have a four wheeler early on, uh, and we rode that thing until the wheels basically fell off. It wouldn't move yeah. anymore. <laughs> but dude, how many? We had to have cut like. Uh, there was, hundreds of miles there of trails was my, like you could probably not stay on the same trail and go back to it the next day and just start from where you left off and never go back the same way you come it's funny that you mentioned going down to that pond because i didn't forget about it but i hadn't thought about it in a long time that was a uh, <laughs> mr baker's pond right yeah, and yeah. we well, were there we was were... baker's pond and then remember no, down the other side was that big lake i don't know what that one was called where we went there a couple times too but yeah, we had to walk down those trails yeah. on the other side of Mr. Baker's land there. Um, and we were little, man. We were like Long 10 years ago, old or something. Like Long time ago. Because I remember we would go down there and fish off the bank of Mr. Baker's pond and catch little bluegill and stuff. Yeah. And then we would walk on down. Probably, I don't even think we were supposed to be at that other place. Uh, I don't think well, mom or dad ever knew about it. <laughs> dad, and we always come to the woods on the backside. So. Yeah, so have you been over in that area since they built it up? Last time I was over there, it's all neighborhoods. Yeah, I went I went there, I think it was last year at some point. I was in the area for something, and I was like, you know what, I'm going to swing in here and see. And it had been a neighborhood there for a long time, but you can work your way through the neighborhood and yeah. and go back down there to where Mr. Baker's land was. I think Mr. Baker's land is gone now. That pond that he always had there with fish, it's like a retention pond now, basically. The big lake is still there, but remember at one point they had built that huge million dollar home on the far side of the lake? I think so, yeah. And the guy had actually probably even called the law on us a few times for riding down there. And and I don't ever remember what the guy's name was, but – that house is still there, and it's gated now. Okay. So the driveway's got a huge, like, iron block gate, and it's, like, the last house in the neighborhood on that street at the cul-de-sac. And the whole lake is all fenced in now. You can't get to it. Because I, I think the reason why I was down there is because I was out fishing, uh, and I was like, there's some giant bass in that lake. I'm yeah. going to go over there, but it, you can't get to it. No, I hadn't been. Like I said, last I knew, it was the neighborhood, four or $500,000 houses. So I never did do much you know, looking around in there and just know there was a neighborhood. Yeah. And so we, <clears throat> we rode four wheelers a lot over there and we did a lot of fishing there. And so in the, in the introductory episode of the podcast, um, I was explaining that at young, when I was younger, I, Like, from the time Papa stopped being able to take us hunting and fishing, I didn't really do anything because Mom and Dad never took us hunting or fishing or none of that stuff. The only thing we ever did with them was they would take us camping, Mm -hmm. like, once or twice a summer. And it was always primitive camping, so we had a tent. And it was at a primitive campground, but 
was the, prim all, yeah. the primitive campground was on at Warhill Park on Lake Lanier, and it was like what forty sites probably, not even. Yeah, not even. And there were no RVs or campers allowed, but it was right on the lake, and it was only tent camping. It was like eight bucks a night. Yeah. The campsite is still there. It's like 40 bucks a night now, yeah, and it's like a, a whole week to even get into the place. Yeah, you have to reserve reservations. Yeah, and so that was – mom and dad only took us camping there so once or twice a year. So we, as kids, never had interactions with the outdoors like that. Until we were a little bit older, dad tried to venture out to Nimbleville a few times. Right. And that – didn't go very well no. either time anybody went with him. No. But when I got my license is kind of when that stuff started opening back up. And then it wasn't long after that is when, well, it was a couple years, but a lot of the big hunting and fishing and camping that you and I have done over the years started around the time that we started the Jeep Club. Right, yeah. And that was like 2015, I think, is when I bought my Jeep, and then you bought yours not long after that. Right. Well, you know, over there where Mom and Dad used to live, we backed up to the lake, so me and Connor, would, after school or during the summertime, we would always go down there and fish, so my fishing career started a little before that. Yeah. Because we would, that was where we spent our time during the summer, was, you know, down to the woods at the lake, swimming, fishing, whatever. Yeah, and when Connor was on uh, a few weeks ago, I talked to him about fishing, and he he didn't mention none of that, but I remember pictures from y'all out there in that cove catching big old fish out there. Yeah. But aside from the that fishing, like I think yeah. what I'm meaning, I think what I'm meaning to say is camping, yeah, like yeah. exploring, overlanding type stuff. Because we did a lot, good bit of that when we had the Jeep Club. Right. And we started the Jeep Club, I think it was in like early 2015. And then neither one of us are in that club anymore. No. And I think there's only one founding member there that's left. The club's still pretty big. It's still going on. But we both just kind of grew out of the Jeeps. But. When we were running around doing a lot of the camping and stuff, what is one of your favorite places that we visited and camped at? Just speaking on terms of Jeeps, because there's a bunch of cool places that we've been on motorcycles. Yeah. But, like, as far as out in the woods and on a full-wheel drive trail or something like that, what what do you think your coolest place is? i got to say probably one of my favorite spots is here pretty close to home up towards Bull Mountain. Um, yeah, Jones Creek was always a good place. I always liked Jones Creek, but the one place that I liked a lot was that little goat path off the side of the trail that we found. I know me and you camped there once or twice, maybe, but I even went back with um, Zach and a couple other buddies, and we would just go down about halfway down that goat trail, is what we called, and just set up. We were there was one point we were set up on the side of a cliff, like I was there for that one. We were up on. It was a bend in the trail, yeah. and there was like a little cove there that was perfect Just enough to enough. bag enough our Jeeps in, yep. and we set up tents. And we were there for a few days, but it was overlooking it was a, a creek. Uh, yeah, there was a creek down the hill. That was a cool trail, and you really, unless you were on a dirt bike or... Nobody else went down there because nobody would, you know... Well, we, we had our Jeeps that were nice, but we also didn't... Not necessarily not cared about them, but we would put them in places they probably shouldn't have been. Yeah, that's true. But, yeah, no, it wasn't like just your normal yeah. sedan or normal family cars getting down no, there where no, we were no. at. Because uh -uh. I remember specifically. I even want to say there was a creek crossing somewhere along the lines. Well, you know, I remember goals. specifically at the beginning of that trail, there was a giant gully that yeah. you had to drive through. That field right there is where I messed my Jeep up real good one time, too, jumping that hill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, blew the front shocks yeah. out of it. Um. Well, what about, uh, um, like, uh, speaking of favorite places to camp, we've been a lot of places yeah. all over the southeast on our motorcycles. What do you think your favorite trip or camping spot has been on motorcycles so far? Oh, I like going to the mountains. 
North Carolina and such. Um, Blue Ridge Parkway is always a go-to. you got to do that. Um, I don't know any specific spots because I don't know the area too good. Yeah. But just about every time we've been up there camping somewhere has always been great. So one of my favorite spots that I've camped in, and I've been back a couple times, was the first time that you introduced me to Hunter – we went on that motorcycle trip for like four days up the parkway right. and we camped outside of Asheville and the spot we were camped in was the big Creek with the waterfall coming down yeah. and it had the big fire ring in there. And you, you and Hunter slept in hammocks that night. Right. It was in the middle of the summer. It was at the end of July. Yeah. You and Hunter slept in hammocks that night and froze your asses off. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I can't remember the temperature, but it felt like it got down to 32 degrees. <laughs> it was wild. And we were right on. So the road we camped on, Amanda and I went back in 2020. We went up there for the kayak race. And the kayak race was about 45 minutes from that camp spot. It was okay. a little drive, but we decided that's where we wanted to camp. So... We went and camped at that camp spot. The next morning, we drove that dirt road that we were camped on all the way up. It's about, I don't know how many miles, but it took us probably an hour to drive all the way up. It, it actually comes out on the parkway. Okay. But remember, we tried to go in from the top. Yeah. That never and it was me. gated. Yeah. And Hunter was like, well, what the hell? It shows on the GPS that you can go in. But it was gated that time of the year we were there. But right. Amanda and I went back in November, I guess, for hunting season. It was open. And so it brings you right out That's on the convenient. park. Yeah, it brings you right out on the parkway. So that next morning, we went up, and I was like, "Oh damn, we're on the parkway already!" So we were headed for Mount Mitchell, yeah. and so we just jumped on the parkway and went straight up to Mount Mitchell. Yeah, that's probably one of my favorite areas. Period. That I've yeah, ever been to. Yeah, that was to. a good spot. So let's take it back to hunting and fishing. And we'll start with hunting. Um, I guess you were technically introduced with Papa, but after those couple times, I don't think you ever did much hunting until your older years. Is that correct? Yeah, I never. No, I never got into it. Not not until I actually had somewhere to go. I guess. Yeah. So Hunter, me and Hunter were talking. Hunter Delay were talking about this at uh, Christmas Eve. The first deer you ever killed was actually over with him, right? Yeah. And how old were you when that happened? Um, I'm trying to think back. It's been it's been six or seven years ago, maybe eight years ago. So I was 19, 20 years old. And that just happened to be a, a like a chance thing, right? Uh, it was, yeah. Like I mean, I, you were planning to go out hunting that morning. Well, but... actually, I didn't even. Well, what had happened was the day before, or the morning before, Hunter had shot a deer out there where he was hunting, and he was tracked it for a couple hours, could never find it. And he texted me or called me or whatever it was, and said, "Hey, shot a deer this morning. I got a couple people out coming to help me look for it. You, if you're interested, like come out and we'll walk the woods. You know, what I mean, get a chance to walk in the woods. I'm down for it. So, especially looking for a deer. So, I went out there and was helping them." track this deer shot down we i mean we even when i showed up we were still tr we tracked it for two or three hours after i showed up looking for this deer and we ended up finding it just so happens where it dropped dead and we found it was was at one of his other stands literally up against the tree his stand was in so i helped him get the deer we field dressed it or whatever um got it back to his granny's I was doing whatever we needed to do with it. And he was like, hey, I'm, I'm going back out in the woods in the morning. Like, my other stand's open. He's like, I ain't got no one else to, coming out here to hunt. He's like, if you're interested, like, come sit in the stand. He's like, chances are I just killed this deer. So there's gut piles right at the stand. He's like, there's a chance you probably aren't going to see nothing. But if you're interested, it's there. I'm like, well, yeah. Like, I went home, got my gear, my gun and stuff, and come back. And we hung out that night and sat in the sand the next morning it was probably 15 minutes after daylight little old six point come walking right beside me and that was your first deer that was my first deer have you killed one since then no i have not and i've been hunting many a time so i've never had a chance to shoot another one so you were over you're 21 when you killed this deer give or take yeah yeah so 
and before that you had probably sat in the woods a few times but yeah, well, nothing I, I was about to say i've hunted with um hunter and connor both they've always had different places to hunt here and there and whenever they have another stand or something they'll always invite me yeah but it was never nothing like serious no no yeah. I'll, once or twice a year if that yeah and so with that being said i feel like you're more hot like your hobby that you participate more in was fishing yes. like you've always liked to fish more than hunting really yeah and so you started fishing a hundred years ago <laughs> no, but like a long time ago right i've never been able to bass fish so i haven't been able to really fish with you on the lake that much because i just don't know how to do it <laughs> yeah. we talked about this with connor like I went out with Hunter Grimm a few times this year on his boat, and he put me right on the fish. I could see him in the water, and it didn't matter. I couldn't catch him. But you were mentioning earlier that y'all fished a lot over there behind Mom and Dad's old place. Is that cove down there where you've caught your biggest fish, you think? Um, I've caught some pretty nice ones down there, but biggest or personal best, no, not down there. And that, so just for reference, the cove we're talking about is on Lake Lanier. It's like two mile or four mile or something like that. I think it's, uh, so it's six mile. I think it's four mile. I yeah, think it's four mile. six, four, two. Yeah, four mile. It's the cove on four mile. It's actually an interesting cove. They have uh, a duck habitat there. Yeah. People There's duck. There's a dammed pe- off pond up the cove a good ways that. A lot of people, even still now when I go by, I see cars parked out there during duck season. Yeah, they duck hunt there. But the cove is strange because, like you said, it's dammed up. Last year when I bought my my sit-on-top kayaks, I parked there on the side of 369 and kayaked up that cove to go in there and fish. And I did catch a couple of nice little bass in there, but really shady area to kayak in man with yeah. all those overgrown trees and stuff in there there's like bee nests hanging from it especially in the summertime it's like well i'm sure it's a whole lot growing up more than it was back then but even back when we we had a john boat that we usually used and there was even some spots where we're having to you know push trees out of the way to get through to somewhere we wanted to go and so you can imagine that's like perfect habitat for some good sized fish up in oh, there yeah. Well, what is your personal best fish, you think, uh, bass? Um, I mean, it's not nothing crazy big, but I'm thinking it's about eight or nine pounds. Pretty good size I've bass, never, though. I've, I've never had a scale to weigh them, but if just guessing, probably eight or nine pounds. That's a good bass, though. Yeah, no, every day you people catch eight or nine pound no, bass. It's a, it's fun. <laughs> what about uh, catfish? What do you think your personal best is with catfish? Uh, I've caught a good good number of catfish, too. Um I don't know, the biggest and most memorable catfish that I can remember is, uh, it was probably about, it had to have been about 10 or 12 pounds, and it was about uh, two and a half foot long, give or take, something like that. Just a small, skinny guy, nothing big. Connor and I talked about this on the first podcast, it's like, just in passing people and talking to people, and you talk to them about catfishing, There's a fair amount of people who've caught catfish in the 38, 40, 42 pound range. And then there's a fair amount of people that catch them in the 12, 14, 16 pound range. Not a whole lot in between really that you hear about. It's either that size or either giant. Yeah. And most everybody I know is in the smaller 12 to 14 because I think the biggest one I've ever caught was 12 or 14 on catfish. Yeah. Well, I think our thing was is we never really got to go to deep water, you know, fish real deep. We're always in the coves where it's always shallow. Yeah. You know, nothing too deep. And fishing nothing. right off the bottom, really, yeah. instead of down in the channels. Right. And and we never catfished on rivers either, really. Uh, I yeah. have tried a few times, but it's not <laughs> – <laughs> it's different. River fishing is way different than lake fishing. Yeah. Um, and so that eight or nine pound bass, did you catch that in like a little farm pond? Yeah. So um, I don't know. I'm sure you've heard us talk about it, but the little four lakes over there, mm-hmm. close to where Hunter, which is also now a subdivision. Yeah, it, of course. Um, there was 
it used to be a tree nursery and somehow they managed to get permission to go out there and fish on it and um they of course like i said with the hunting they always brung me or invited me to go do that kind of stuff so i was always down for it yeah we didn't specifically talk about that those lakes but we did talk we got on the topic about uh fish and farm ponds and how you can't really fish them anymore because mm -hmm. whatever you know but so after we at, you don't really fish a whole lot or hunt a whole lot just here and there when you get a chance yeah. um, but i think the most recent thing after the jeeps we got into motorcycles Right. You bought your motorcycle now. You want to tell everybody what it is? Yeah, it's a 2018 Kawasaki Z900. And uh, for those of you wondering, that is, it's not a full fairing bike. It's a naked bike on the front, but it is a street bike, or uh, a lot of people call them slant bikes in the bike world. Yeah. It, you bought that bike brand new, zero miles. Brand new. And how many miles are you pushing on it right now? Um, I just recently, well, I wouldn't say recently, about two months ago, I had uh, tires put on it, chains, sprockets, because that was all way overdue. Um, I think when I left today, I looked at my odometer, I'm pushing uh, 21,000, almost 22,000 miles. And you said it was a 2019? 18. 18. And so, but you bought it in 19, right? Yes. So it was a closeout deal on the... You in bought it in April, because yeah. you bought it on your birthday. Yep. Uh, April of 2019, so in two... They were trying to clear out their inventory to bring in the new bikes. So four years. Yes. So in about... I'll have it paid off in about six months. Okay, so closer to five. Yeah. So you've put 21.9 on it in five years. That's a lot of riding. Uh, well, I mean, this past year, I hadn't really even rode it any. I yeah, didn't... you got a truck, but yeah. the year before, it was an everyday driver. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it didn't matter, just... rain, snow. Yeah. <laughs> I've been at times there's ice on the roads when I was riding it. Yeah. And so you had the Z9, and a lot of our friends have motorcycles. So in this spring, summer, and fall, we do a lot of riding. Oh, yeah. So it wasn't just an everyday rider. I was going out on trips I mean, with Jake, I was going every three days or something. Like yeah. That. And then hitting the weekends, you know, Saturday all day, I was out riding. One of the longest trips that we'd done together was, uh, well, the trip to Savannah was long. Yeah. We did that with Jake. Yeah. But the trip down to South Georgia, that was, that was <laughs> insanely <laughs> long interstate riding. Yeah, that was a, it was fun, though. Yeah, it was like six hours of interstate riding, and Nathan was on his bike. I was on a KLR 650, uh, fully loaded down, and then my wife was following us down Interstate 75 south of Atlanta, and Nathan and I rode at 100 miles an hour basically the whole way. Yeah, we were cruising. <laughs> <laughs> and so we stayed in South Georgia with family yeah. uh, in a little town called Folkestone, which is about – uh from the state line it's five ten yeah. minutes but it's like 45 minutes from jacksonville yeah 45 minutes from jacksonville and then one of my favorite beaches we go to every time we're down there is amelia yeah. or fernandina, fernandina beach we actually rode to fernandina beach when yeah. we were down there so we rode all the way there we rode all the way to fernandina we rode all the way back to georgia we rode around. Uh, we did a lot of riding when it was down there. Every, we rode through the swamp, all kinds of stuff while we were down there. And then we got ready to leave, and we decided to ride at night. We barely made it back out of Waycross, and my bike took a shit. Uh, I didn't adjust the chain properly and just ate the front sprocket out. Yeah. How was that ride back by yourself? You know, it wasn't, it wasn't bad. Um it was different coming down because, of course, she was always in front leading. So when I would see you let off or, or, you know, coming up to speed traps, whatever you want to call it. So it was different having to – I was having to pay attention a lot more. Yeah. If that makes sense. And also you got kind of lucky because mom and dad waited for you and Tiffany. Yeah, they uh, – once they found out that you were down and I was going to continue, they stopped and waited on me for a little while. Yeah, and then so you got the – ride with so, them yeah. all the way back but that was 
going down there and coming back because I ended up having to do that trip back by myself when I went back down and fixed my bike and then brought it back. But we left at like two o'clock in the morning to go down there and the ride down, I thought was pretty fun. It's like three o'clock in the morning. We're cruising a hundred miles an hour on the interstate, no traffic, just riding. And it was just, it was kind of chilly in the morning. As soon as the sun came up, it started warming up instantly. And then of course (laughs) when we got down there, it was like 900 degrees. It was miserable. (laughs) Uh, and then we went to Savannah one time. That that was a long ride out through. That ride was a little different though, because we stayed off the interstates. We on the way down yeah. for the most part. On the way back, yeah. we did too. But we were riding some back ass roads on the way back <laughs> in the middle of nowhere, two lane roads, nothing but fields for miles, nope. and these just little bitty towns. And we came. We were all hot through this one town. I don't know, man. We had to have been running probably 70 or 80 when we rolled up into the town. I, I never looked down because all I seen was lights. <laughs> but he said we was only doing 60. Yeah, well, but, maybe because we rolled off the throttle. <laughs> but we were rolling hot into the town, and he he was sitting around the side of the building with his lights on when we came around the curve. None of us seen him. He yeah. somehow seen us. And... Dude was pretty cool about it, actually. He rolled up and was like... He didn't even completely stop it, I don't think. No, he just yelled out the window. He's like, y'all need to slow the hell down. Do not come through my town rolling hot like that again. And we were like, yes, sir, let's go. (laughs) And, of course, we left there. Running running, 75. Yeah. Uh, That was a fun trip. On the trip down, we actually got to go see something that probably doesn't exist. Well, it absolutely doesn't exist anymore, but it probably will never be able... No one we'll be able to recreate some of the pictures that we've had there. And that's the Georgia Godstones. Yeah. And so for those of you who are listening, that don't know the Georgia Godstones got blown up recently and they actually dozed them, the rest of them down and they pulled up the time capsule and all that, didn't they? So I heard they blew up whatever blew up the one. Apparently they deemed it unsafe. They came in with a dozer and within like two hours, they dozed the rest of them. Yeah. I have heard they dug up the time capsule, but I don't know if they ever opened it and seen what was inside or whatever. I heard they dug it up too, but I didn't hear anything else about it. So the Godstones are pretty wild. What do you think about those? That's different. That's crazy. I I mean, I don't know how else to describe it. Like, you don't see that everywhere you go. No. And for those of you listening, the Georgia Godstones were – a six, seven, eight giant granite stones or uh, slabs Slab. that were erected in sort of like a Stonehenge circle. Kinda, yeah. What was there? Four or five of them with the top stone. Yep, and then four or five of them had top stones, and in each one of the upright slabs, there is the 10 commandments of what they're going to call the new world. And it's written in the 10 major languages of the world. So each slab, so there there has to be 10 of them. Yeah. That makes sense. So well, there was on each side too, I guess five. Five. And so on each side, there was a different language of the 10 commandments and all around and the 10 major languages of the world. And like you start getting into a huge rabbit hole when you start talking about the Georgia Godstones, because yeah. the whole point of the Godstones are, in conjunction with a theory of the the pole shifts, yeah. the pole shift, the oceans are going to rise, and that would be the spot on the east coast that would be the highest point. It would be sort of the New Plymouth Rock. Right. So this was going to be where all the new people coming over would go to, and when they land there, they would that's see they these see. stones, and it would be the Ten Commandments of this new infrastructure that's created after the pole shift pretty wild theory that I had heard of years and years ago. And then the Georgia Godstones, I found out about them and went and visited them. And when I went with you, that was the second or third time. I still don't know what to make of it. And I guess that's why they're blown up because some (laughs) other people didn't know what to make of it either. And there's a whole backstory on the Godstones. Nobody knows who put them there. Uh, All they have is one name, R.C. Christian, yeah, so and they say that RC Christian is just an uh, like an acronym or initials or a made up name for another guy that existed in a maybe real or maybe not real Knott's Templar secret society. 
So if anybody's listening and you want to know about the Georgia Guide Salon, you can go look those up on Google. There's plenty of information <laughs> out there, but that's a lot of information to get into. But we went there with Jake, and so we have a picture of my bike, your bike, and Jake's bike in front of these guide stones. Yeah. And I made sure to save that picture because I believe I still have my it, phone. it won't it won't ever be able yeah, to be recreated. No. I have read that they're planning on rebuilding them. Oh, really? I hadn't heard or that. Or making it into an actual park or something along those lines. Who knows? Probably not. They say that they were blown up by, you know, some random civilian, but the CCTV footage they put out, I didn't see a random civilian blow it up, uh, but, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So we got we we got into motorcycles. We did the did a lot of riding. Um, we went to Savannah, Fernandina, and then we've been up on the Parkway. Yeah, twice now. I, or, believe, um, I don't know. Uh, well, I know we've been up there in the area more than once, but I don't remember if the first time because it was me, you, and Zach the first time. We did the tail of the dragon. Yeah, we didn't ride the parkway that time. We rode. We did the Cherahala, um, the um, foothills parkway, and all those. Yep, and the foothills, Cherahala, and the dragon, and Nanahalo Gorge. Foothills Parkway is probably on the top of my list of yeah. favorite places. So, this recent trip I did with mom and dad, they were talking about those. I don't even know what they're called, the bridges yeah. or whatever they are. Um, there was a road they wanted to go down because they had some of those on there, and I was telling them about the Foothills Parkway. Apparently, I didn't know about it. And I, I was trying to tell them about it, but I don't know the area too good, so I could never point them in the right direction. But, that, yeah, that's what I was telling them. That's one of the probably the best parkways to ride for views and such. When we rode that, it had only been open for like a month. Yeah. And we rode it from Townsend, which is just outside of Cades Cove, Smoky Mountain National Park, over to Pigeon Forge. Okay. It's like 17 miles, I think. Yeah. At least half of that are those bridge styles where you're just out. Instead of going through the mountain, they went around, yeah. literally, and you're just out in the air riding these roads well, that go around, and you've got – a panoramic view the whole time. I've still got several pictures of when we were stopping some of those bridges and take pictures. Yeah, me too. Just like we're sitting in the clouds. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. We've did a lot of camping here in North Georgia up around Springer Mountain and uh, things over in that area. I was telling mom and dad, do you remember when we went up, you went hiking with me on the AT? And we camped at the top of Sassafras Mountain overlooking the ranger camp mm -hmm. years ago. You were in a hammock, and I was in a little one-man tent. It was really dumb. It was really <laughs> cold, and we both froze all night. Yeah. Do you remember the the booms Loud and the bang. bombs going yeah. off that night and the helicopters yeah. flying up out of the woods? Yep. And so I was telling mom and dad about this, and they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, it's right above the ranger camp. Like, we camp right there. and you hear helicopters all night. Yeah, I'm uh hear helicopters and gunshots and loud mortars and mm -hmm. stuff going off the army rangers down there training not far from where we we're doing that is the rock creek fish hatchery and we've done a lot of riding jeep riding out there yeah. and fishing uh you never really got into trout fishing all that much i never could get the hang of it <laughs> I don't know. It's too slow pace for me, I guess. It's funny how that works. <laughs> like, I love to trout fish, and you love the bass fish, but we can't do the opposite. Yeah, I, I, don't get me wrong. Like, I, if I can catch a trout, I'm down for it. This trout's good eating. The trout is good eating. And uh, speaking of eating, you you do a lot of smoking. I used to. I don't have a smoking grill at the moment.